Uh, kids always do that, don't they? They go, hey, dad, hey, dad, hey, dad, 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 dad. And they just, you're in the middle of a conversation. Hey, mom, 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 what's this? What's this? Kids just get away with a lot of stuff that adults can't get away with, right? Or perhaps my, one of my favorites is this. If you're a kid and you eat food and you don't like it, you can just spit it out and go, bleh. And you can totally get away with it. No one, you know, no one pulls you up for it. But if you're an adult, and let's say you, you know, you've, you've visited someone's house and they serve you some food, you can't just spit your food out onto your plate, can you? You have to eat it. And even if you don't like it, you have to... Wow, that's great. That's delicious. Because you're not allowed to say that you don't like the food. Or what about this? Kids have no shame at all, right? They just run around the house naked. You can't do that while you're an adult. That's not allowed. And the other thing kids get away with, they're just able to say what's ever on their mind. I don't know if any uh, parents can relate to their kid just coming up to a stranger and just looking at them and saying, oh, you're ugly. You know, kids just say whatever is on their mind, even if it's not socially acceptable. But if you're an adult, you can't go up to someone and shake hands and then just say, oh, hi, you know, I'm Matt. Oh, I'm David. Hey, David, you look really ugly. You're just not allowed to say that. And, you know, we like to think that because uh, we're adults, we have these social graces. We've learned good social etiquette, right? Uh, And we do things that children or toddlers just don't do, like in the video. But there are a lot of times where adults can act very much like children. Particularly in a spiritual sense, there are a lot of ways, especially in the way that we relate to God and to sin, where we just act like grown-up children. Now, the social graces and social etiquette disguise it to look a bit differently, but often the pure desires or impulses or actions are actually just the same as children. And so what I want to do is this morning, we're going to look at a biblical passage and see how people can have a childish or immature response to sin and to facing up to that sin. And then looking at how it is as adults, we sometimes do the same thing but disguised in a different way. So we're going to look at the story of the first two babies. Now, who would those two people be? Cain and Abel, Abel, right? They are the first two people born to Adam and Eve. I would say, though, perhaps they are the first two people ever born, but they're not the first two babies, let's say. Think about Adam and Eve. They are literally the definition of the phrase... I was born yesterday. You know, you usually say, oh, come on, I wasn't born yesterday. Adam and Eve literally were. They are the the definition of being born yesterday. And we see in the biblical narrative that they're a little bit gullible, they're a bit naive, and they're almost like babies. They're full-grown adults, but they act very uh, immature at times, and they can act like children. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 3 together. And we begin to see, we're going to find some ways in which we all act this way. Genesis chapter 3. And we'll just begin in verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to Eve, Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice, what is the defining characteristic of the serpent? He's cunning. He's clever. He's deceptive. He's manipulative. And very soon we'll see that Satan's cunningness is contrasted with Eve's naivete, with her gullibility. It's really an unfair match that we're about to see. Satan, he's described as cunning... And Eve isn't quite as smart uh, in that regard. It continues on in verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, Look, we can eat every fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. 
Now, I'm not sure if you realised that in that text as we read it, because I doubt Eve realised it either. But already, Satan, uh, Eve has fallen for Satan's lie. What was Satan trying to do immediately? Try and cause distrust, mistrust, trying to cause doubt in Eve as to whether God really had her best interests in mind. And Eve has actually already fallen for it because she says, look, we can eat everything, just not this tree. We're not allowed to eat of it and we're not allowed to touch it. What's interesting about that is if you go back to when God gave the explicit command to Adam and Eve. Just in the last chapter, God says, don't eat of the tree. But God actually never says, don't touch it. Eve's made up this rule. God never said, don't touch the tree. Eve is the one who says it. And so already she's beginning to fall for Satan's lies that God is restrictive. He's trying to keep things away from you. He doesn't even want you to touch it. And so already Eve is beginning to fall for the tricks of Satan. And notice as well that children seem to be very much uh, attracted to things that are forbidden. And here Satan is playing on this desire to want to go for the forbidden. Let's continue on in verse 4. The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And here we have the fall of humanity. Satan, he succeeds in tricking Adam and Eve into eating this fruit, this forbidden fruit that God explicitly told them not to eat. But again, it's like it's a childlike instinct to want to always go for things that are forbidden, to to do things that they're told not to. Uh, As I was preparing the sermon, I asked mom and dad, hey, I need a really good story about how when I was a little kid, I did something wrong and I got hurt. And dad's reaction, he just laughed. He goes, oh, come on, there's so many, you know. Because children are always doing that. They're always getting themselves into trouble. And so one time, uh, as I was a a little child, we had these visitors over for for dinner. And I don't know what it is about children. They always like to try and impress visitors or guests when they have someone over, right? They always get a little bit extra cocky when somebody comes over because they want to impress them. And so everyone's eating dinner. And there's a a big bowl of chilies. And everyone's eating these chilies. And being the cocky little kid I am, I decide, yeah, I could eat some of those. I said, hey, Dad, can I have a chili? Dad says, no, you don't want the chilies. They're too hot. Dad, just trust me. I know what I'm doing. I know I can eat the chilies. Dad says, no, the chilies are too hot. You'll burn your tongue. It's not good for you. Trust me. Don't eat the chilies. And I go, Dad, trust me, I know I can handle a chili. So Dad says, okay, you can have one of the chilies. Mom says, what, don't let him eat a chili. And Dad says, no, it's all right, let him learn. He's got to listen to his parents. He, he wants to eat the chili, let him eat the chili. So I grab one from the bowl, put it in my mouth, and my mouth is immediately on fire. I'm probably crying, you know. It was terrible. And the irony is, to this day... Basically, everyone in my family eats chilies except for me. I'm the one person who can't handle chilies, and that's as an adult now, let alone as a kid. So I had no hope. But isn't that interesting? Kids always say, Dad, it's okay. I can eat the chili. I know it's all right. Hey, God, it's all right. I can eat the fruit. I know what I'm doing. Just trust me. What's, the, what's going on in that situation? The individual is saying to God or the, you know, the parental figure... I know better than you. You've told me otherwise, but I'm going to trust my own instincts as opposed to your wisdom. And here we see Adam and Eve doing the exact same childlike thing of prioritizing their own wisdom above God's. And then I wanted, now we begin to see, now that they know good and evil, now that they understand what sin is, we get to see 
their response to sin. And this is where I want to look specifically at how their childlike ways are not so different from how we react to sin today. So let's read verse 7. They eat the fruit. They realize they've done the wrong thing. What is the first thing that Adam and Eve do? Verse 7 says, The eyes of both of them are opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. What's their first instinct to do? Hide. Hide. Not only that, but hide the problem. (laughs) Pretend like there's nothing there. If we hide the problem, then it makes it look like there is no problem. Now, the irony about hiding their nakedness with fig leaves is that the fig leaves don't actually hide the problem, do they? They expose the fact that there is a problem, that they are naked. So in their efforts to try and hide the problem, they actually made things worse. The kids do the same thing. You know, they break a vase or they break a toy, whatever it is. As soon as something's broken in the house, what do kids do? Oh, I've got to hide it. Pretend like it never happened. Because if I hide the thing that's broken, well then, I can't get punished, right? It's the natural instinct to hide the problems so that you don't have to face the consequences. But how do adults do that? We're not really ever in a situation where, you know, we knock over a vase and we have to be accountable to someone now about we broke someone's, you know, precious item. In fact, you're not really ever morally accountable to anyone, you know. You eventually leave home, you start your own life. You don't have, you know, parents in the same house with you telling you what to do and what not to do or giving punishments for when you do the wrong thing. There's no real moral accountability in that aspect. But adults do still try and hide or cover up their sin. In a way, in the way that we interact with other people, we make it out as though there is no problem. We try and hide the problem from other people. It might not be a parent, but it might be your friends. It could be people in their church family. It could be work colleagues. Each individual person struggles with different Sins. It could be uh, gossiping. It could be sexual morality. It could be uh, neglecting time with God. There are a variety of private sins that we do in isolation. But when we're together with other people, we're not going around and promoting it, are we? We pretend and hide the problem to make it appear as though there is no problem. And that can be a serious issue because it means that there's never any chance to progress or actually address the problem. So what is the solution to hiding or masking away our private problems? Well, I don't think that uh, you're under any obligation to have to tell every single person. You know, obviously, a lot of the, the struggles that we deal with in sin are very intimate and very personal. But what it's going to take is telling at least someone. The problem is that the sin is being done in isolation. When there's isolation, there is no accountability. But as soon as someone else is brought into the situation, now you can actually address the problem because now someone is keeping you accountable. Whether that's a a friend, a family member, someone in your church family, a, a pastor or an elder. If you find that you are struggling... In this way, the first and most crucial step to overcoming this response to sin is making sure that you have accountability towards someone. Let's continue on. Uh, That is the, the first way in which we do it. Adam and Eve, they tried to hide their sin, their nakedness with fig leaves. We hide our sins by keeping them private and in isolation. But the solution to overcoming that is making sure that we have accountability with someone. Let's continue reading in verse 8. We see the next way that Adam and Eve respond. Uh, Verse 9, sorry. No, sorry, verse 8, I was right. Verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So, first of all, they tried to hide their mistake. What's their second to go to? They try and hide themselves. Uh, 
It's the exact same way with children. Children think, uh, if I just run away and hide somewhere, I can avoid the punishment. I was babysitting for a friend of mine uh, at college. And uh, they have a, a little boy about two years old that I sometimes look after. He, he's a really, really fun kid to be around. He had a, and he started looking at a window. And the, the dots started connecting. And he grabbed the fan and he threw it right at the window and it made the biggest bang sound. And as soon as the fan made contact with the window, he turned around and looked at me. And his face was just one of pure fear. He was like, oh no. He knew that he had done the wrong thing. And within a second of meeting my eyes, he ran out of the room. He immediately ran away. And he started calling out for his grandpa. And I just thought... You have tiny little legs. You're barely two years old. You really think you're going to be able to run away from me? But kids do that. They try and run away. I think uh, most children can relate to this story. They do something wrong. And their mum says, just you wait till dad gets home. He'll take care of you. And all the kids go, no, no, no. I'm going to wait for dad to come home. That's the worst. What's he going to do? And then you you have to wait for the anticipation of dad to come home. Oh, what punishment am I going to get? And then it start, the cogs start going in the kid's mind. Well, if I hide from dad and dad can't find me, then I don't get the punishment. And so kids, they, you know, they hide under the bed or behind the curtains or in the bathroom. Wherever it is, they think they'll actually be able to avoid the punishment. But it's futile because there's only so many places you can hide in one house. And eventually your dad is going to go through them all and find you. But Adam and Eve do the exact same thing. They try and hide from a God who is omnipresent, who is everywhere at all times. No matter where they hide, God was going to find them. It was just as useless. But how do adults today do the same thing? Try and run away from the problem. Well, again, it's not as though we're morally accountable to anyone. It's not like you're trying to run away from your dad before he comes home anymore. The way in which adults, and this is both Christian and non-Christian really, but specifically the way that Christian adults can run away and hide from God is through escapism. And escapism really is just defined as anything, any activity or hobby or whatever it is that you do in order to not have to face reality. It's immersing yourself in any activity so that you no longer have to address the real things going on in your life. And this can be, uh, you know, obviously sinful activities. A lot of people will turn to, you know, alcohol and drugs, you know, bad things like that. But it can also be completely innocuous activities. It could just be hobbies, you know, like going out and gardening or going for a bike ride. If the purpose of doing that activity is not purely, you know, just for enjoyment, but is so that you have to, so that you can find a way to no longer have to think about the sin in your life, to be able to escape from whatever it is that is pushing on your conscience, that's a form of escapism. Perhaps the most prominent ways that people do it today, uh, you know, with technology. We have so much access to to movies and shows and social media. And even if, you know, the things that you're consuming are good or decent, again, if the motive is purely to escape from having to address the sins in your life, that's a form of escapism. And it's very prominent. I think it's a very prominent thing that a lot of people do in order to not have to face up and fess up to the problems that they're dealing with. So what's the solution to a response of sin of escapism? Well, the first thing, of course, is to address that there is a problem. Escapism is all about covering up the problem. It's not there. But the first step is having to address that there actually is a problem. And we do that, of course, through prayer and through repentance. You have to communicate that to God. Communicate to God that you admit that there is a problem of sin in your life. But then you also have to change your circumstances. Uh, And that's in two ways. First of all, change your circumstances 
so that the sin that you keep going back to is no longer possible. Make it so that the temptation is not even there. But second of all, change your circumstances so that the form of escapism that you frequently use is also not an option anymore. Make it so that you discipline yourself to no longer use that activity as a form of escape. You have to be able to change your circumstances in order to overcome this approach to sin. So, just as Adam and Eve, they tried to run away from God and hide from Him, adults today, we run away and hide from God, not in a physical sense, but in a, a, a mental way. We escape through activities, through uh, movies, through television, through sinful things, whatever it is. We try and escape and hide from God in a way that we no longer have to address there is a problem. But the solution to that is repentance and actively changing your circumstances to make sure that the temptation for sin and the temptation for escapism is no longer possible. Let's continue reading. We see the next response in verses 9 and 10. It says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. What's the motivation for Adam hiding and trying to cover up his nakedness? It's fear. Children very much work in the same way. Uh, people have noticed that children's sense of morality develops over time. To begin with, the very base stage is children will do the right thing in order to not be punished. Kids begin to realize, man, every time I do the wrong thing, something bad happens to me, I get punished. And so it's the fear of punishment that often drives children to do the right thing. But then eventually they get a little bit older and kids get a little bit smarter and they they pick up on this. Hmm. If I do the bad thing, Bad things happen to me. But if I do the right thing, sometimes good things happen to me. Often I get a reward. And children really work with the reward system. That's you know, why we have stickers to kids. You, uh, there's a kid, Billy, you sat up straight, you get a sticker, you get 19 more of those, and you can get a prize from the, the prize box. Children work in a way where they want a reward now. They realize it's not just about avoiding bad consequences. Doing the right thing can also get me good things. And by the time you're an adult, ideally you want to be doing the right thing, not because it's the right thing, uh, not because it's uh, a way to get rewarded, but because it is the morally right thing to do. You have principles now, and you do the right thing because it's the right thing. But that's not always the case either. If everyone did the right thing because it was the right thing, there would be no need for speed cameras, would there? The whole idea of a speed camera is most drivers aren't driving to the limit. They're not obeying the rules because they realize it's a good and safe thing to do. It's being a good citizen. Most people keep road rules because they don't want to be punished, right? The whole idea of a speed camera is that it's an incentive to tell you, if you break the rule, you're going to pay a fine. We'll deduct some points off your license. And a lot of the time, that's the only reason people keep road rules. It's motivated by fear of punishment. Or perhaps uh, in workplaces, a lot of people, they'll only do as much as needed to get the job done. You know, I don't want to work super hard, but I need to do enough so I don't get in trouble with my boss. And there are a lot of instances like that just in our daily life where we do the right thing, not because it's the right thing, but uh, we don't want to get punished. In a spiritual sense, sometimes we have the same approach to God and his law. Perhaps sometimes the motivation for keeping God's law is not so much it's the right thing to do, but it can be motivated by a fear of, what is the consequence or what bad thing is going to happen to me if I don't keep the law? 
For some people, that is a very true reality. But the solution is actually quite simple. If you are, uh, if you are in uh, a state where you have fear of God, all it takes is to replace that with love. We're told in 1 John that perfect love drives out fear. The two cannot coexist. So if you have a loving relationship with God, then you can't have one in which you are afraid of him. And in order to cultivate that relationship, the simplest answers I would give is read a, a gospel, any gospel. We're told that we love God because he first loved us. So read about how God has loved you so that you know then how to return that love. Read a gospel, but I also, the book that I always come back to over and over again is First John. It has so much to say about love and what that practically looks like when you're in a relationship with God. Those would be my two, uh, two go-tos. And of course, you have to nurture a relationship with prayer with God. So in prayer, read a gospel, read First John, and create a loving relationship with God so that fear can no longer exist. So... Just as Adam and Eve, they hid from fear of God, sometimes we too can be motivated to obey God purely out of fear. But the solution to that is to create a relationship of love with God so that fear can no longer exist. Let's look at the final way in which we can sometimes approach sin in a childish way, just like Adam and Eve. Back in Genesis chapter 3... And verse 11. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, Look, the woman you gave to me, she gave me the fruit. That's why I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? And the woman said, Look, the serpent deceived me. That's why I ate. What are they trying to do? They're trying to pass the blame. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how they immediately go, well, it's not my fault, it's so-and-so's. And not only that, notice what both Adam and Eve do. Adam says, I only did it because Eve did it, and she's the woman you gave me, God. He's trying to blame God for this. Ultimately, it extends to God, and Eve does the same. Well, I only did it because of the serpent that you made, God. They're trying to pass the blame back on to God. The solution to this approach is actually quite simple. Why, what, what actually led Adam and Eve to this point in the first place where they were hiding from God? A lie. They fell for Satan's narrative. Satan told them a story in which they sounded like heroes and God was this vindictive villain... And they fell for it. But we do the exact same thing in our minds. We, we come to a, a, a situation where we have to make a choice. And how often do we make excuses like, well, I wouldn't normally do this, but... Well, you know, 99% of the time, you know, I do the right thing so I can get away with this one. or Whatever excuse it is, we do them frequently. Ellen White says... It was a spirit of self-justification that our parents first indulged in. And she says it originated in the father of lies. We're always trying to justify our actions. Well, I wouldn't normally. But as soon as we begin to tell ourselves those stories, that's when we fall into the trap of sin. If there's a, a, a point where you have to make a decision and you immediately, like sense that you're about to tell yourself a story or self-justification stop it don't even let the thought play out because it's dangerous but let's say the thought does play out here's one way I find effective if you've let the thought play out say it out loud because often we only ever say these things in our mind right and they make they sound as though they make a lot of sense when you have it in your mind But as soon as you say a lot of these excuses out loud, you realize they don't really hold up. 
or how silly they sound when verbalised. Even imagine you're saying this to someone. If you're in a court of law, would this hold up? Well, I wouldn't normally, but... When you say things out loud, you, you hear for yourself how silly a lot of these excuses are. Don't allow yourself to make those excuses or self-justification. The other thing that uh, Adam and Eve do here, they blame each other, and in blaming one another, what they actually do is they try and drag someone else down with them. They try and drag someone else into the punishment because no one likes being punished by themselves. We like it when there are other people to share the punishment with. Now we don't feel so bad. I remember uh, one time in year seven, my friends and I would play on the basketball court uh, all the time. We loved playing basketball. And around the front of the school, they had these hedges. And one day we realized that the hedges were actually hollow inside. They, you know, they looked really thick and full, but there was actually, they were totally hollow on the inside. And I don't know what it is with young boys in particular and cubby houses, but they really love you know, building forts and cubby houses. And so we found this, this hollow hedge and we thought, this is so awesome. It's like a natural cubby house. But no one went in. Because we thought, ah, you know, this, this area probably is out of bounds. No one had told us explicitly, but we thought to ourselves, we're probably not supposed to go inside. So day after day, we'd kept, we kept playing basketball and we kept looking at the hedge and just wondering, wouldn't it be cool if we went in there? And maybe after about three or four days, somebody bravely says, that's it. I'm going in the hedge. And all of us were shocked. <gasps> He's going to go inside. He goes inside the hedge. He crawls in. And we hear his little voice call out. You can come in. It's hollow. There's heaps of room. And immediately everyone just goes, that is so cool. But no one was brave enough to go in. We we're all too scared. Then the next day comes, and the same kid goes in. He goes into the hedges. And then a few more people decide, well, he didn't get caught yesterday, so maybe we can get away with it. So a few more people go in. And the next day, everyone's in the hedge, except for me. I, I stood by my principles. I went, no, I know it's the wrong thing to do. And a few days went, and I, I stood my ground. And probably after, you know, maybe about a week or so had passed, I caved in. I really wanted to go inside the hedge. I wanted to see how cool it was, because all anyone ever told me was how cool the hedge was. Yeah, it was a hedge. <laughs> it's not that cool. So I decided, well, no one else has gotten caught yet, and, you know, it doesn't seem too bad. So I went in with everyone else. We lasted about five minutes before we heard, hey, get out of there. Oh, just my luck. Our first instinct, shh, no one talk. We're not in the hedge. <laughs> what was our first instinct? Hide the problem. Hide the problem. We're not even here. I know you're in there. Come out of the hedge. Oh, all right. So we came out, but we had a story. You see, we thought if we couldn't hide ourselves, we could try and hide, you know, our, our motives. So one of us had taken a handball in, and we said to the teacher, well, you see, we were only in the bushes because we wanted to find our handball. We'd lost it in there, so we wanted to look for it. Now, why do you think that story doesn't hold up? You don't need ten people to look for one handball. And so the teacher was like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So running away and hiding didn't work. And then the one thing we took solace in was this. At least we're all going to get in trouble together, right? No one likes to get in trouble by themselves, but when the punishment is shared out, it doesn't seem so bad. Anyway, we're taken to a teacher, and we were actually petrified because we were, you know, we were a good bunch of kids. This was like uh, the one wrong thing we'd done you know, in the year. This is our one stain on our record, we, and we were petrified. We didn't know what was going to happen because we didn't get in trouble. And then the, this teacher just talked to us, you know, explained you did the wrong thing, and we didn't actually, there were no repercussions actually. But as we left the room, he said this one line. He said, Now you boys, you do know the consequence of a repeat. And we went, yeah, 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 we know, we know. And he said, all right, good, just don't do it again. And so we walked out, no consequences. But then I started thinking, 
What does that mean? You boys know the consequence of a repeat. Now, in hindsight, what he meant was, you know, if you do this again, if you repeat the action, there will be consequences. But for a little kid, you're not thinking too rationally. So in my head, I'm thinking, you know the consequence of a repeat. Oh my goodness, if I do this again, I'm going to have to repeat a year. I thought he meant I was going to have to repeat a year of school. You boys know the consequence of a repeat. And so for days after this, I couldn't get any sleep because all I could think about was the fact that I was going to have to repeat year seven. Why was I going to obey the law of the school? Fear. Fear. I was petrified of having to repeat. Obviously, that would never happen. But for a little kid, that's what I thought was going to happen. I was completely motivated by fear. And the way in which that we drag other people down, it's not as subtle as just saying, well, at least we're all going to get in trouble together. No one ever does that in you know, the adult world. The way in which we try and drag other people down into our trouble is similar to how we blame other people. If we just say, well, so-and-so is doing that, you know, well, if Dave is doing that, I'm sure it's fine if I can, you know. Uh, well, I'm not such a bad person because, you know, Bill over here is doing it. We try and rationalize our sin by comparing ourselves to other people. And in effect, we drag those other people down to our level and say, well, if as long as we're doing it together, it should be fine, right? The solution to doing this tactic of approaching sin is to get a different standard. If the standard that we always use is other people, we're never going to progress. We're just going to keep sinning. If we're always sharing the blame out and dragging other people down, pardon me, by saying... <laughs> Other, uh, well, you know, this person's doing it, should be fine for me too. Nothing is going to ever change. What it requires is that we get a different standard. If we use God and his standard, if we use Jesus as, as our standard, we will constantly be aspiring to do better, to not commit sins, and in fact, to show love to other people. So in conclusion... As we have looked at the story of how Adam and Eve react to their sin and to God, we realize that it's very much the same way that children do. But also, if we're honest with ourselves, many of these tactics that Adam and Eve and children use, some of us may still use today, just more cleverly disguised. The core principles or actions or motives are identical. They're just done in a slightly different way. But instead of hiding and running away from our sins, we can look for accountability. Instead of running away from God through escapism, it just takes repentance and a changing of your circumstances. Instead of hiding in fear and only obeying God out of fear, create a relationship of love with God that drives out fear. And instead of blaming other people and dragging them down to your level and comparing yourself to other people, get a different standard, one that, aspire, one that makes you aspire to be better, not to be complacent and like other people. I think ultimately what all of this can be summed up as is this. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, If you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, you have to humble yourself like a child. Isn't it interesting that our approaches to sin can often be so childish, and yet Jesus also says, in order to get into heaven, you also have to act like a child. But not in these ways, act in a way of humility. What was Eve's mistake? It's okay, I can eat the fruit. Trust me, God, I know what I'm doing. It was pride and arrogance. Dad, I can eat the chilies, I'm fine. I know what I'm doing. It's a pride in oneself as opposed to humility before God. But God, Jesus said to his disciples, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, become like a child, have humility, trust in me. And really what all of these solutions ultimately are is a trust in God. I pray that as we leave church this morning, we would think about these things. Look into your heart and see in your life if you relate to any of these methods in which you hide away from God. And if so, don't be afraid to humbly come before your Father and just say, 
I need your help. That's my prayer and our desire for this morning. Thank you.